Hello, can you hear? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. I don't know if this is better. Hi, how are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Hello, Hello. yeah, we can hear you, ma. Okay. Good Thank morning. you. Hi, good morning. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, too? Good, good to see you. Good to see you too. Well, Take we are to see you. We are already three minutes late. Um, yeah. Uh, you're Fire. supposed to be the second person. So, Ma, I think you can go ahead with the panelists on uh, on Zoom. To why those physical are getting set? There is no physical. All of us are supposed to come on here, so. And we have some that are with us in Vegas. Oh, okay, okay. Some people that would love to listen. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Ayo, would you mind like starting for us because the first presenter is not even here. Is that okay? Oh, I don't mind. But if there's someone else who wants to take it, I'd prefer to still retain the second spot. It's just me and you. I don't see. We are supposed to be four but it's just me and you okay okay let's do you want to wait for like one minute okay one more minute and then out, okay. out. Yeah. all right Hello everyone, welcome. We're sorry we're running late. We're just waiting for the other two presenters. We hope we, we hope to start in the next one minute. We're sorry. I'm gonna make my okay. I can go now if Okay, thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody to this panel. My name is Ruth Upper. I'm going to be the chair for this panel. Um, the name of our panel, as you know, is Gender in Popular Culture, the Life and Times of African Women Musicians. Um, thank you so much for coming here to listen to us. Um, our first presenter, unfortunately, is not here yet, but we're going to start with a second person which is Ayo Dele Ibiyemi. Did I say your name correctly? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, Mr. Ibiyemi will be speaking, or Dr. Ibiyemi will be speaking on gender making and indigeneity in the music of Lijadu sisters. Okay, take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm not Dr. Ibiyemi. <laughs> So I'll be talking, speaking to, to today about genre, genre making and indigeneity in the music of the, the of Lijadu sisters. So 
Lija Ju sisters are two Nigerian sisters who sang in the nineteen who sang in the nineteen sixties and the nineteen seventies. That's when they were popular. So one of them is late now, and the other one is still alive. So their emergence then in the sixties makes them arguably Nigeria's first twin musical duo. So eventually, this idea of twins singing in Nigeria became popular. And we had we've had like many cases of that, and the speech quail, and also we've had like dual bands in Nigeria too. But these were like the first set of identical twins to perform together professionally in the sense of being professional right now, as we know it now. So in an industry that was dominated by men in those days who were singing genres like Juju, which was very popular then, I Live, Jazz, which was Imagine in the 70s, Sakara too, and Akbala and those other things. So the, and even Fela's Afrobeats, which was imagined then. The Lija Adusis has experimented with different sounds to create a style that is very distinct. But it wasn't just about creating a style that is distinct. They also did multiple genres. So you had song, they had song that was reggae, which was also popular then. They had a reggae track. They had an aquala. And it wasn't as if they did these things in faces. They mixed it up in different albums. So their first album had, had like an aquala song and their second album had a, a juju song and they, they sang in folk tunes also. So they did some Afro beats also. So this experimentation created a style that is very distinct. And so what my presentation does is to examine the style of the Lija Adu sisters and as one that as a style that defies popular notions of what constituted Nigerian music in this period, and also notions of what we consider as popular in this bifurcation of popular music and arts at music. So I examine their lyrics as operating a form of decoloniality that is rooted in the paradoxical relationship between their Western education and Yoruba culture. So a lot of investigations of 1970s music in Nigeria have viewed the period as responding, responding to the aftermath of the Nigerian civil war, the oil boom. There's always so much talk about the oil boom being like one of the most important periods in Nigeria and how there was so much money and people were train parties and the music was the music was really a, a major thing for people and a lot of people have compared the 1970s with current time with the current with nigeria music's current decade which is also a very successful decade with the performance and the global acceptance that afro beats afro beats with the s now that it gains in the it gets in the world now so one other thing that i do in this presentation that I'm trying to do in this presentation is still in development, is to analyze what the leader do sisters did and their career as a whole as some sort of countercultural practice that overlooked the event that were popular in the country at that time and also precauces what we consider as Afro beats now. So some of their lyrics and might not fit into what we consider as Afrobeat now because they had lyrics that were like very folk, that was very didactic, which is not exactly the kind of thing that Afrobeat does now. But in terms of the sound, the experimentation. So I'm still thinking about the kind of, the, 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 the exact way to explain the kind of thing that they did that doesn't make it experimentation because I consider the word experimentation very simplistic for it, but it was something that took from multiple genres without losing focus. So it was like a cohesive body of work that, so what I think happened with them is that the, the sound was loose, but the lyrics were very co coherent. So, and then they operated multiple levels of mini making. So they tapped from folk tunes sometimes and did like multiple other genres. So the idea of genre for them, they, they make genres very fluid. So there's been many discussions about this thing, about popular music and art music and, uh, one of the most popular is it relates notion of what would consider in, in the essay is African music possible? What we consider as art music now and what we mostly consider as art music and, and how people would think, oh, European art music has no place in Africa. And it's claimed that as a matter of fact, the same kind of thing, the same kind of nuances that gave birth to European art, art music is what, what we consider as indigenous African music does too. So I'm using this framework to, to examine what the leader do sisters did with their song. So you would find songs that would begin with like a folk sound and then would sing in both English and Yoruba. So 
one significant thing that's like uh, one of the popular song is common norm so he said by with common norm and then he sounded he started it continues with the yoruba translation of it so they kind of moved between the two languages they also sang an Hausa song and they sang in Igbo too so so what this kind of does for them is to help is that it helps to it, it, it helps in my in my understanding of what they were doing it helps us to imagine them as creating something that is very rooted in indigenous ethos but also foreign but by foreign i mean it's only takes from foreign influences in a very way that the relationship between the two was is very mutual. So that's the kind of analysis. That's that's my understanding and my reading of the kind of songs that that they did. So, and it's important to add some more context to the 1970s, the period where they were successful. So the there was oil boom. There was a lot of cultural activities, and then there was like political experimentation in Nigeria. And it was also a decade of global black solidarity that culminated in the second world black and african festival of art and culture first act and so it was in this period that they released their the fourth their five albums so they it was like their major decade they went on a tour with king sonia day in the u.s and even before this they had interacted with both black uh, uh, both uh, uh, musicians from the black diaspora and even white musicians because they were side on the deca aphrodisia label so this meant for them that also they claim that according to Taiwo in an interview she, she said that we're not limited by genre when it came to genre we did not limit ourselves so what they did then was to tap from the influences they had a mother who sang who was a musician but not in the way that we consider a professional right uh, in this period but they claimed that they were exposed to the Beatles they were exposed to um, all kinds of other music from the world and they, they were exposed to the juju sound, sound they were exposed to Tunde Nightingale and both sounds from all over the world and this is reflected in their work and they sang about they sound like a mixture of jazz afro beats reggae and even aquala and they sang about hope corruption inequality love family poverty and born an identity that was distinctively african so the style that they used okay one second Okay, good. So I'm um, also examining that song as being archetypes that did not reflect what we would consider as archetype. Some uh, ex examination of the Yoruba kind of the songs that emerged from the Yoruba areas of Nigeria in that period, I've examined them as being like social, reflecting a form of social modernity that was of that period, distinctively of that period. But Lija Dud sisters define. By that. And even though they did not identify publicly as being feminists, they did what was very feminist and their music deconstructs notions of heteronormativity as we know them by helping us to imagine modernity as being also like indigenous, being uh, helping, us, uh, helping us to imagine Yoruba and, uh, by extension Africa as being a, an important part of modernity in that period. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really awesome and straight to the point. Um, please, if you have any questions for Ayodele, um, save it or you can just put it in the Q&A box. Uh, we would like to go through and then we'll take Q&A. Everyone just know, welcome Rukayat. Everyone just know that we are supposed to present for 15 minutes and then we have we're supposed to have 30 minutes for Q&A, but we lost five, so we have 25 now. So uh, welcome, Rukayat. We're going to um, listen to Rukayat's banjo from the Bayero University. Um, Dr. Banjo will be speaking on the veil in the crowd of turbans, Waliya and her popular music arts. Please take it away. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. 
Um, I'm so glad to be here. And um, I will be talking about um, Ualia and um, a popular music art. I'm just testing the waters with um, this work. I It's a research um, I have nearly embarked on. And so these are just, um, my presentation today is just going to be the fragment of whatever I've been able to gather on the field, um, knowing that um, a lot more work will go into it. And so uh, my topic is the veil in the crowd of turbines, Uwalia, and our popular music art. And so by uh, giving the background, I'll begin my discussion unbiasedly with this image of uh, a Muslim woman in burqa. And uh, burqa is uh, a covering, uh, we can call it niqab too. So the veiling system um, has centuries in history and uh, in most traditional societies and in faith. But um, looking at all of the societies and the faith um, around the world, because uh, the three Abrahamic uh, religions and Indi religion women cover. And so I think uh, the most criticized of all the coverings um, are the Muslim women. And so that is by my way um, of introduction. A lot of things definitely are responsible to it from um, historical antecedents, we know that uh, covering in Islam has been said to be uh, a restriction of uh, the women's um, freedom and all of those things. And so covering in Islam started uh, with the introduction of Islam. So when a woman is covered, when a woman is eating, Looking at it now, there are two perspectives to it. The eating locked up and the eating being out and not being seen or being heard. And so these are the perspectives I'm going to be looking at the veil from. And so here I said the revolution against female compulsory covering has a long history in the world. Most recently is the protest by Iranian women against head coverings and hegemonic practices by the Iranian government. This practice of head covering is symbolic to the practice of the kule in Northern Nigeria. And so now I go to what the Kule means. The Kule means to lock up in Hausa language. It's typical of having a box, probably a safe where you keep money, where you keep valuables, and you lock it up for fear of being, um, you know, vandalized and uh, your property being cut away. And so it came with the introduction of Islam to the Northern Nigeria in the 14th century. This practice. Um, I'll, I'll say Islam eradicates some cultural practices that are seen to oppose the Islamic principles. And so it went on for a long time and uh, it's, it's uh, instituted the Poda system. The Poda system is a system where women are kept in the house and are not seen by people. They do not engage in sociocultural or economic activities outside of, of their own. Whatever intervention they want to make, whatever contributions they want to make should be from the confines of their home. And this was done by the Seriki Mohammed Rumfa. And so it was reaffirmed in the 19th century by a jihad led by Usman Danfodi. And so I'm going to talk about the contextual information. The study examines the situation of the Hausa Muslim women within the context of the structural contrasts of the public and the private social space and the potential for changes in the established life options or in the realities of the social environment. And now when we talk about Huda, when we talk about Islamic doctrines, we are talking about um, a system where uh, that has consciously, yes, built and constructed the definition of what should be private and what should be public. And of course, we know that in context, it has to be regional. It has to be, you know, uh, relative to a particular people. It has to be peculiar to a particular people. The concept of what is private and what is public is with a people. So that is that. And I look at the creative options before, be, before those women, because if a set of people or a group of people in the society are 
um, excluded from engaging in certain activities in the society, especially public activities? How much can they contribute to the larger society from the confines of their home? And so I look at the creative options before these women and their performance in the spaces using Ualia as a case study. This is the picture of um, Ualia. And uh, so I'm going to talk about how this relates, how the study relates to the theme of the conference. Now, a major trend in scholarship focuses on cultural aspects of the role um, of men and women in the society, especially how Aousa women have been confined to the domestic life and thus endurable invisibility and historical silencing. We are talking about the colonization. How has the colonization played out in Northern Nigeria, particularly in Kano, where Uwalia resided, was and resided till her death. And so this is what I am going to be looking about. This study focuses on how Hausa Muslim women have transcended the Kule, that is the private sphere, to be a voice and an agency and penetrated the predominantly male, that is the public sphere, using the popular music art, to collapse the separationist ideology. Now, I'm quickly going to talk about um, what I mean, um, what I mean uh, with uh, the separationist um, ideology. You know, with the introduction of Islam, certain practices were forbidden, and one of those practices is the mingling and intermingling of the males and the females in um, public settings. And so. Women and men, if at all, they have to come together in a social function or social gathering, must not sit together. And so it is prevalent since the introduction of Islam to Northern Nigeria in the 14th century and re reaffirmed and reinforced in the 19th century by Usman, which is still very, very much prevalent, even in the universities where I teach. When I attend the Senate meetings, we have the males sitting on this side and we have the females sitting on this side. And so uh, the separationist ideology has a long history in uh, Kano. And so that is what is playing out. So I want to look at how, despite the ideology of separationist, women have been able to find their voice and become visible to the outside world. I'm going to talk about Ualia because she is uh, my case. Ualia, um, as I got to know, was a highly principled and very sociable person, hence the nickname Ua, which means mother, and Lia, which means a crowd. And um, I, I want to say that uh, when I submitted my topic and abstracts for this panel, I, I coined my, um, uh, my title as the veil in the midst um, of turbans. Ualia and a popular music art. But when the title was rephrased and sent to me, I realized that it better suits the purpose of my study. Because uh, from the name Ualia, I see that Lia is a crowd, it's a battalion. And so how does she fit into the study? And so because Lia is crowd, I I I was happy when it came back and I said, oh, how people read minds and um, how uh, the world of academic can actually, you know, a form of telepathy and um, it works for me. And so Ualia uh, is loosely translated as the mother of many. Her name was Zaina Mohammed uh, Mahmoud, but because of her generosity, because of her amiable nature, because of her, um, her, her mien, she drew a lot of people to herself through um, her, her actions by empowering women, advising women, and all of those things. And so she was named the mother of many. Ualia um, is the originator of the music genre called the Amada. The Amada is a, a type of song, is a genre of music in the Northern Nigeria, particularly performed by the female folk. How did this song start? It used to be called Waka King Darby the song of the flow, which um, I would say works songs. We know that as females, when we do chores at the house, we sing, you know, to enable us to do more than uh, we can do, or probably to just help us get through. And so this is how the Amada genre of music started out. It wasn't called Amada when it started out. It was called uh, Waka, Wako King Dabi. That is a, uh, the songs of the flow. Now, how, why 
do they call it the works of the sun? I gather that um, the women used to be the one to build rooms for intending um, grooms. And so these women married into the same family or who live in the same um, family house come together when it is time for um, a groom or a potential groom to get married. Out there, there's this um, architectural pattern that is peculiar to the Northern Nigeria. And so we usually have, or they usually, I'm using we now because I feel I've been acculturated, I've, I've lived with them, so I am using we. You may want to pardon me for that. The architectural design is different from what we have in the Southern part of Nigeria. And so we have the male houses, especially the males who are, who are um, of age to be married. And so to avoid any form of, um, you know, um, I would say interaction, intimate interaction that are not permitted between siblings of different genders. So the males are usually situated far off from the houses. And so when the a man is about to get married, the women come together to make the floor. That is the foundation of that room. And so they are the one who makes the ingredients. Uh, that is, um, the mud, the cement, the sand, and all of those things that would make the floor stand. It is during this exercise that they come up about with songs to help them carry through. And so, you know, they are so creative with it. And um, my uh, one person I interviewed, that is the grandchild of Ualia himself, said that he grew up seeing his grandmother lead women do that. And so they would be so creative that they would have to with uh with uh trees chunk of trees cut down or chunk of trees cut down they would have to design some form of plastering um i i don't know what they call it that we used to plaster the house and so they would make it they would dry it in the sun with with chunks of chunks from the tree and so when it is dried that is what they use to you know Plastered the mother the floor. And so it is from there that this uh, Wako King Dabe grew. And so, you know, when the separationist ideology persisted that in social gatherings, the women cannot sit with the men. And, you know, we know that women at location would sing, they would have to marry, they would want to dance, and all of those things. People would want to sing. And what kind of songs will they want to sing? And so, Initially, when Ualiya started out, she would go to these functions and started singing. According to the grandchild, uh, her voice was not so ple not pleasing to the ears. And so I asked him during the course of the interview, I said, how do you define what is pleasing and what is not pleasing? And so as we went um, further in that conversation, I realized that he probably was just being jealous because he did not have uh, the, uh, the grandmother the way he used to have him to himself because of the new um, engagement, that is musical career that Ualia engaged in. And so that is how um, the Amada genre started up. So she would go for functions and they would need people to sing and she would just sing voluntarily without charges, without anything. And so people began to recognize her and they, 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 they really loved her voice, they loved her concept. And so from there, she started infusing all that social issues away from this work songs in her songs. Now, um, I'm going to talk about the influence of culture and religion in, um, on our songs. There's no way we can roll out um, religion and culture in the songs of Northern Nigeria. And so I have written here that Uwali existed in an epoch when the Poda system was still at its peak. Due to our conformity to Islam and Hausa culture, Uwali had shewed anything non-compliant with the religion of Islam and culture. For instance, at the beginning, Uwali used the Kalangu and so I have the picture of the kalangu here. This is similar to um, the traditional Yoruba drum that we call the gong gong. We know that it is a, member, a, a high sounding membrane phone that when it is beaten here, we hear as far as wherever we are. And so she started out using the kalangu uh, at the performances, which she later learned for Calabash when she learned that Islam does not allow women to use it. And so, um, here, when I was talking to uh, the people I interviewed, I had to bring in uh, the question of gender dynamics and gender, gender politics in Northern Nigeria. Because I know for sure that most um, male singers in Northern Nigeria use the Kalangu music. And so why was Il Uwali told to drop the Kalangu music? 
one of them told me that when she started out with the Kalangu, um, the Kalangu drum, that the clerics in the area who are major stakeholders in, in, in Northern Nigeria, especially Kano, um, Kano, which is the, the, the center of Islamic civilization in Northern Nigeria, called her to inform her that the Kalangu sounds too high. It pitches too high. And so as a woman, as a female musician, she must not use the Kalangu drum. That means she is being heard and being heard too loudly. And so I from that 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 is my interpretation. That is my input of what has been told. And I, I asked him, I said, oh, so when men stopped from using the Kalangu music, he said no. I asked the other person and he said no too. And so, you know, that's I I I I could able to weave my head around the situation, the politics going on, that a woman can be heard if that is if she must be heard, but not too loudly. And so she left the Kalangu music because she's a conformist to the Islamic religion and our culture. And so um when she left uh the Kalangu uh the Kalangu drum, she switched to the choir. This is the choir. I have a <laughs> sorry for that. Um, I know the picture is not clear. These are the fragments. These are the things I could get from Uwalia because nothing, I, I, I don't want to say nothing because you can't say nothing has been done about uh, a particular person if you are researching or a particular phenomenon. But I, as much as I have gone, I have gone to places, I've gone to radio stations who, who have existed for so long and they could not get me anything on uh, Uwalia and Yamada. So I managed to get, oh, I managed to get, um. I know, I know. So I managed to get uh, these videos to give you an example, uh, to give you an insight into what Wali and Miyamada um, instruments is like. And so I'm going to play a video. <laughs> Okay, uh, that is that. I thought I was going to have time to play the video for a longer period of time, but um, that is that. And so she left the Kalangu for uh, the Quaria. That is what we call this. We call them the Quaria, the Kalabashis. Um, and so um, I, I have said there that the important significance of um, Uwaliya's music. As per Islam and uh, Hausa culture, men and women should not co both in social gatherings or otherwise. Like the clerics, Uwaliya too advanced that men and women separate in their musical performances. She was modest both in, both in dressing and speech, and this earns our respect for all. Although she wasn't earning much because she started out when music wasn't paying, but she had a large audience. She would be called in Katina, she would be called in Taraba, she would be called everywhere in the northern states and so she you know uh, perpetrated and she propagated the ideology of the separationists too although most of her songs you know bordered on um uh, prevailing social and political issues we have um, um some of her songs at least the little clips i have seen that's the much i can gather where she critiqued uh the concept of polygamy Men taking second and third and fourth wives. She 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 critiqued men who do not have money and marry one wife or two wives, which is very prevalent in the northern part of Nigeria. And so, from the little clips of our uh, of our performances that I can get, that um, you know is evident. And so, I am bringing this picture here. This is a picture of Barmani Chode. Uh, Excuse me, Ruke. Do you want to round up this? Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um. So thank you. I have said there that um. Um, I am concluding that I am going to be looking at this work from the double context of perception of their work. I'm going to be looking at the double meanings of the veil, I propose the construction of identities along with gender dimensions to the expressions of the popular music art of Uwali Ami Amada. And so um, I'm going to be doing this vis-a-vis Spivak's concept of subalternity. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Rukayad. Um, that was awesome. I hope we get time, you know, to talk about this thing. Please, the presenters, look, keep your eye on the chat. I'll tell you when it, when you have five minutes more, two minutes more, okay? Um, so our next presenters, you all can hear me, right? Yes. yes. Um, our next presenters, I think there are two 
gentlemen, and they'll be speaking on rethinking peace and unity through popular culture, a social musicological reading of the music of Fumi Adams, Onyeko Wenu, and Edna Opuli. And these, this will be presented by Oloru Mowaju Ayodele. Um, oh, is this like one name? Oh, okay. You have like six it's names. Name. I thought it was two people. <laughs> huh? It's a compound name. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, From an Ahmad Bello University. Okay. Well, welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, please stay uh, let me start from the second name. That's uh, Ibukun Lua. Okay. Uh, All right, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, Aidele Obatomi is a scholar from Amadou Bello as introduced by Enkoff. Uh, it's a popular music um, develop um, leadership uh, scholar. Ibukoloa also is from the same uh, university, so from the sociological uh, department. And uh, aspects of scholarship is peace, peace study and gender studies. So this is music. I would like to have sounds. So as we have our set, we come and end, I will be able to go in it. So we are taking it back to the 80s and the 90s. For the sake of our time, we like to pause the music here. Yeah? You, if you are, if you have a good reflections back to the eighties, the nineties, that you'll be able to complete the whole song in that album. Our, our musician, which we shall be talking about, looking at their work, having a social musicological rhythm, how their work reflects on peace and unity, and for the need for us to think into peace and unity because of the importance of this concepts in our society for national development, we shall be looking at the works of uh, Fumi Adams, Oyenka Ueno, and uh, Edna Oboli. Quickly, we'd like to talk about these musicians. Um, we have Oyenka Ueno, who happens to represent the eastern uh, part of the nation. Here from there, and our composition reflects about the nation as a whole. We have Fumi Adams, who happens to have a dual identity as said, a Yoruba background and also have uh, an Aousa uh, background because she was bred up in the northern region in such a way that she was given title because of her influence in promoting the northern culture through a uh, popular art of music, composing both uh, English music in the English art uh, region and also in Aousa dialect, promoting the culture in such a way that her name was uh, was changed from Fumi to Fatima and Adam to Adamu. So the Northern people refer to her as Fatima Adamu. Why do we call her Fumi Adam? Because that's her original name. And we look at Edna Oboli, who is acclaimed as the Nigeria reggae queen, somebody that uh, represents the that represents the South South region, because coming from the Bene. Uh, ben Old Bender, uh, this region, which now we call uh, the 
data. So I think with this, we'll be able to have a representation of at least four ethnic regions, and that's a good representation, uh, representation in this work. Now, looking at the work of the of these studies, we are looking at peace and unity be a global concept that is essential for development. And the fact remains that this part is important, is a challenge both in the nation and uh, the globe at, at, at large. When you look at it, Nigeria as a nation in the global ranking of positive peace index ranks so low, below 0.2%. Uh, uh, and the fact remains that effort towards restoration of peace in the nation and at the world as a whole is a challenge because the amount of resources that that uh, that that is being attributed to warring nation to be able to up uh, and to be able to 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 be able to champion the the, the 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 path of peace is something that would have been channeled into great development in every region in every nation in the world and when you look at it the concept of peace is necessary despite the fact that even a nation as a whole uphold peace as part of our dogma and part of our treasures being enshrined, enshrined in all our national symbols, like the anthem, like the coat of arms, like the pledge, peace is still a challenge in our country. We may say we have peace in the nation because where we are, there is no war. But peace has gone beyond that. And the, the fact remains that to be able to advance the, the, the cause of peace in the world, music is one of the major or one of the instruments for advancing peace because of its popular appeal. In 1982, world musicians came together to sing for Africa, uh, Africa for Peace. People like Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, and others, they came together to sing Africa for Peace, the We Are the World. And that will tell you the importance of peace in the nation and how music, due to its sonic effect, is able to draw souls together. When I play the music from the beginning, you feel calm, you feel loved, you are at peace, you are joyful. That's the aspect of music in the society. But aside its sonic effect, and aside is instrumental value, the fact remains that the messages enshrined in the words of these uh, three popular music artists, they are so essential to be able to drive peace in the world. You may ask, do we have peace in Nigeria? I know the answer will be yes. You may ask, what kind of peace dominates our society? beyond Nigeria, the world. What level of peace do we have in our society? Peace, which is a global necessity, as I earlier said, for development goes beyond the absence of war in the society as defined by numerous scholars. What lots of people believe or see time as peace is, once there's no war, there's peace. No, but it goes beyond that. It is a condition that promotes positive human existence and development. The fact remains that two kinds of peace exist, the negative peace and the positive peace. Why the negative peace explain the aspect of absence of war, which we see? Positive peace, on the other hand, define peace, define peace as people feeling safe, equal, and having the freedom wherever they find themselves, and even having the, 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 the necessity of developmental benefits in their land has been given by the uh, politicians or the political officers. With this, I know you know the kind of peace we have in Nigeria, certainly, negative peace. Let's look at the global war mapping of peace ranking. If you look at it in 2013, you look at it, Nigeria, what happens to be in this place? You see, as of 2019, we are ranked as, with other, this year, our status of peace is at a medium level, global peace. That is the positive peace index. Now, when you look at it, 
almost a decade after, in 2022, you will see Nigeria now has dropped down from toward very toward low level, low status. Now, this is an indication that we need to rethink about the concept of peace and how we'll be able to deploy the arts and other means in the promotion of peace in the nation. Else, we go back and start expressing what we have in Sudan. They thought they were at peace after the independence, after the breakout, but now they're back to war. Let's look at what's happening at Russia and Ukraine. Because of the dominance of negative peace, they back to war. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's an indicator that we need to go back because the peace level in the nation drastically is dwindling and there's need for us to go back to it. This topic, or this uh, presentation, sorry, is anchored on two theories. The social musicology theory and the peace building theory. So looking at the works of Oenka Oweno, we'll be looking at their works in line with this topic, with these uh, theories of uh, social musicology uh, theory and the peace theory and see how they were able to deploy it. Social musicology the theory explains music from the social context. Beyond the musicality, it looks at how music is able to what influence positivity, activities, and people in the society. Music from the social dimension and its influence on individuals in the society. Peace building theory looks at peace. Just as we've explained, look at peace as a dynamic approach and framework for strengthening positive peace. Our essence, when we speak about peace here, just as explained within the two broad, uh, broader perspective of peace, the positive and negative, peace building theory is, we'll be talking about peace from the peace building theory aspect. That's what we'll be looking at. All right. The works of these three and three musicians explain so well about what we need to do about peace in the society. First of all, there's an uh, audio here, which uh, video here, which we won't be able to play because of time. So we look at the first song of Oyenka when because we are looking at a reading, social musicological reading of the song. In the first song, let's look at peace song. This is a call for women and the people at large to be able to sue for peace. Because as women, women in the society are those, women and children are those who suffer most about the negativity of war. That the fact that there's no positivity of war except those who take advantage from it because of yeah, the monetary aspects of purchasing and exchanging of uh, weapons and uh, warring uh, implements. But to the society is negative. And what she says here is, we need peace, we are the children of Nigeria, we are the women of Nigeria, what we want is peace. So let there be peace in our hearts, peace in the home, peace in the nation and the world. Peace starts from the heart, and because it starts from the heart, it must be positive before it moves out. If it's negatively in, in influenced, then it's going to affect at least to what negative behavior outside crisis, conflicts, building, and which actually will destroy. The fact remains that peace is a concept that is enshrined in, aside in the fact that is being enshrined in our constitution, in the society is something that we, 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 we use in a daily basis. Uh, for the Christians, for instance, when you approach somebody or you knock at the house and um, the doorstep and um, post of someone, your first greeting should be shalom which means peace unto you. For the Muslim, for instance, your first greeting should be salam or alaykum. But even with the exchange of hands, imagine that and in most culture we exchange hands for that. But how can we speak about peace with the hand when there's no peace in the heart? So it's a contradiction. If the heart is not peaceful, there will be conflict in the society. And that's what our message says. So she's calling on peace, not only by the women, for everyone. And this portrays the fact all our mother Teresa supports this, that if you want peace in the world, go back home, love your family, and there will be peace in the world. The song which we skip to play is One Love, Lead Us Together. 
This is a song that even um, at present, this contemporary region is being used. Um, one of the Nigerian uh, uh, contemporary artists decided to do a remix of it. I invited Uenka to have it because of its importance. That is a, an example of rethinking of the importance of the past songs in our present world to be able to, 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 be able to retain positive uh, message. One love keep us together. Living in a world where we struggle because of struggles to be able to live, yes, there, there's that tendency to be able to what have a uh, rancor, to be able to have a uh, conflict because where there's struggle, there's friction. But in all this, you saying that this can be done in a positive way. Where you win, I win. No one is being injured. One love keep us together because when we don't do this struggle in the this, in the art of love or the eyes of love, then we're going to war against each other kill each other and destroy ourselves, then no one will gain anything because the world is full of tension and struggles. Let's look at quickly, let's look at Fumi Adam, the first song we played. He said, I know a lot about my country. I know a lot because I came. I know a lot about her people. I know a lot because I'm here. The fact remains that Nigeria belongs to every one of us and working together is the key. That's unity. Love and unity, very important. Very important to sustain peace. Nigeria is our beloved country. If you look at the future, if we must sustain the future, we look at what is happening in this present. There's a need for us to rethink. And if we are rethinking for progress in the land, is to rethink on the path of peace. So these uh, popular musicians, this type of popular musician, female musician, their their works points us on the pathway of positivity to be able to sustain the progress of the land. And uh, when you look at the next song, by uh, quickly, let's just take from a reading from Edna. Edna says something. He said, this is my message to the youth. And what is a message to the youth? He says, stand for your rights. Yes, many of times we say, what well, you stand for our right, and because of that, we go in the, on the pathway of violence. No, but when we want to rethink peace, we reflect back and look at the, uh, the movements in America. So what sort of injustice are we face that people, the, the Black Americans have not uh, encountered? But if Martin Luther King could use peace to be able to win the war, then a reflection from the past in line with the works of these musicians will help us and know that war, uh, peace is the best culture. Instead of exchanging guns, exchanging bullets, the part of uh, the, 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 the colonialists which we inherited, that will not help us. We have to come back and look at the part of peace, even in asking for our right. He said, and be careful in what you do. Don't forget, we don't forget whatever we do today, we gain it or we lose it. And so stand for your right, stop the fight. You may lose your life. Stop the fight. You may lose your life. Stop the fight. You may lose your life. Um, drop the stick. You know, she tried to make us to understand that the six years stand for weapon for war. And basically, in this uh, modern age, that's the gun or whatsoever uh, nuclear weapons that you used to destroy. But we need to drop that. That's not the part we should be looking at, even in trying to, 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 to fight for justice. To fight for justice, that will not help us. But we have to go the path of peace. And quickly, when we look at their work in summary, Fumiada is saying that Fumiada. Nigeria. Yes, you thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Fumiada is saying Nigeria, all we need is love. And Oyenka picked it up from there. Say one love is what we need and peace. Uh, Edna, in her own way, picked it up. He said jealousy is not what we need. We didn't talk to it there because of time. Jealousy is not what we need. And that's a message to the youth. So the summation of their musical overs addresses the underlying factor that militates against social peace, hatred, jealousy, unhealthy competition, discrimination, and some other factors like social injustice, economic marginalization, corruption, political exclusion. And these things are some of the things that the peace concept uh, uh, scholars said, these are the things that actually can trigger and lead to negative peace or conflict in the society. And so finally, we said, this piece being a global commodity for social development, the trial music artists, Wayenka, Fumi Adams, and Edna, they are peace ambassadors. 
Nigeria Peace Index on Global Math is very low and needs a boost. What do we know? So popular culture like music, we can actualize this. Wherever we are, we can act like this. It needs for everyone to promote peace, either as a music producer or distributor or a consumer. We need to revisit such songs in our playlist, even introduce them in our lecture rooms. We will help to promote peace and take, because when people have a reflection on it, we will help to promote peace in the society. And so that also will prevent war in the society because to prevent war is far better than being victorious in war. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's like a really good way to start my own presentation. Do you want to stop sharing so I can share my screen? So my name is Ruth and um from Syracuse University. Today I'll be talking on performing motherhood through national song and is also like a case study of Onyeka. So I'll just share my screen. Can you please hear me? Yeah, okay. We hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so music in Nigeria functions in various ways from identity cultural and educational transmission, religious and healing purposes, entertainment and social commentary, protests and international relations. These functions have been geared towards community building since pre-colonial times and national and nation building beginning in colonial and post-colonial Nigeria. Many singers have written songs that promote unity and renew hope in times when the country is troubled. Nigerian national songs reflect its history, complex identity, and culture. The songs reach, range from anthems to popular and folk songs, as well as songs created within indigenous genres. However, the complexity surrounding the creation and sustainment of Nigeria as a nation makes it difficult for many citizens to perceive these songs as <clears throat> patriotic symbols of national pride, identity, and unity. An effect of colonization is that Nigeria is in constant need of nation building through art and culture. While early, early writers, theater artists, and visual artists contributed to this nation building, this paper adds Onye Komweno, a female musician, to the list of Nigerian nation builders in contemporary times. It further reveals the gendered nuances of motherhood mandate in Nigeria. Drawing on scholarship from African women and the roles and theories of motherhood, interviews, autobiographies, archival materials, and song, this paper answers the question, how does she play a maternal role with sound, lyrics, and visual and music video as represented in the centenary song, This Land Celebrating 100 Years of Nigeria? This research places the African woman at the center of the often overlooked issues concerning music and motherhood. It speaks to the broader issues concerning music, women, and nationalism. Oye Kowenu, in 2014, Oye Kowenu was commissioned by the former president, Goodluck Jonathan, to write a song to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Nigeria's unification in 1914. Through, through collective performance, lyrics, instrumentation, and visual representations, she mothers an imaginary unified Nigeria with the centenary songs. Child workers' theorizations of motherhood is paramount to understanding how only Oweno mothers the Nigerian nation in this song. Walker has long advanced Kaplan's conceptions of motherhood in the African context beyond collusion with patriarchy, a role imposed on women by men, and difference. How the motherhood mandate affirms differs in different African cultures. To capture the multi-layer and different reference that characterize the concept of motherhood, Walker highlights two different terrains that motherhood encompasses, the practice of motherhood, the discourse of motherhood, and the social identity of motherhood. The practice of motherhood entails physical and emotional care and involvement. The discourse embraces dominant suppositional and marginal issues that constitute the analysis of motherhood in specific cultures. Motherhood as a social identity necessitates an analysis that centers women's construction of their own identity as mothers. Walker's three conceptions of motherhood are reflected in the centenary song, which features many actors and musicians from various ethnic groups in Nigeria. 
The issues addressed in the lyrics, the hybrid nature of the musical instruments and instrumentation, the visual representation can each be fully analyzed through the lens of motherhood. Continuing her inspirational songwriting, Owen wrote the song with beautiful lyrics. Some fans, however, consider these lyrics controversial, claiming that they misrepresent the actual situation in Nigeria. The complexity and nuance underlining the lyrics and visuals in the music video speak to both sides. Analyzing them through the lens of the three conceptions of motherhood helps to clarify the increasing complications surrounding Nigerian identity. The table shows how the lyrics can be categorized to fit these three conceptions of maternal. On the practice of motherhood, the lyrics are meant to give Nigerians glimpses of hope. Motherhood continues to shape women's involvement in Nigerian politics as mothers are expected to intensify social pressure to conform to what the culture says or what the culture decrees. Nigerian mothers play critical roles in society by leveraging their various talents and skills to respond to societal needs. Perhaps one of the most pressing needs in the Nigerian contest is uniting its many ethnic groups. Owena sings about Nigeria being on her mind while pledging her loyalty and love. She asserts that Nigerians are on their way to a new Nigeria and everyone should be ready to celebrate in Nigeria where peace, equity and unity reign. In the lyrics under the discourse of motherhood, Owena captures the actual situation in Nigeria. The diversity and ongoing struggles of Nigerians are evident in its history, and day-to-day -day operations. Nevertheless, Owenu becomes the architect of the new Nigerian, utilizing the same song to construct an imagined so social identity. The third category in Walker's conceptions of motherhood. The controversial lyrics represent an imagined Nigeria that is far from reality. Walker acknowledges that social identity allows for an analysis that sees mothers as agents while exploring the internet interactions between motherhood and society in constructing subjectivity and determining behavior. To the agency women have to feel and think about their roles as mothers, both consciously and unconsciously. Owen is imaginary Nigeria, far from reality, typifies a conscious dimension of social identity. Some Nigerians have strong feelings about this song and they confirm this, dual, this duality while some accept the song wholeheartedly as they think it is a great song that it aims to be patriotic, many think it fails to portray the actual situation in Nigeria. So I'll play the song. Um, I don't think I shared my sound. I'll stop and share again, sorry. I don't think I shared my sound. Please give me a thumbs up if you can hear this.
going to stop there <laughs> so singer and activist Tony Ekwenwene's role in unifying the nation through song which is also seen as a maternal role has attracted admirers and fans throughout the continent she has been called the lady of songs and the elegant stallion while Owen's centenary song overlooks deep-seated historical and current ethnic tensions and narrates an imagined unified Nigeria it reveals how Owenu models the nation by guiding Nigerians towards national unity. Her views for unity are sometimes shaken due to ongoing ethnic tension, but Owenu is still known for successfully transversing ethnic boundaries through music. The idea of motherhood is not only tied to reproductive rights, biology, or marriage. Instead, it is invested in social identity that pays attention to constructions that legitimize societal conceptions of motherhood. Thank you. So I'm done with my presentation. This is part of a larger project. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so we have, um, I think 22 minutes to, you know, have a conversation. Um, thank you so much, everyone. This has been wonderful. I see we already have one question. Um, oh, yeah, we already have one question for Ayo Daily, if you can read that. Yeah, um, I just but I, said the answer. Oh, you already yeah. do you want to talk? <laughs> I'm gonna read it so you can, you know, talk oh, to okay. us about yeah, it. Okay. That's um fine. are you placing he needs the the sender needs a clarification. Are you placing Lija the sister star within Afrobeats or Afrobeat? You know, they are two different yeah. um, genres. What are the prevailing elements in their in 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 for their style of music, you know? I think the prevailing element could be a pointer to the genre, genre naming or placing their styles within the existing genres. Yeah, please, we'd like to hear your thoughts. So, thank you. I wish I had more time to actually play the song as you suggested, but what they did was not Afrobeat. And it also was Afrobeats. So my mention of Afrobeats with the S now in, in my presentation is so that I'm trying to explain that they precursed what we call Afrobeats now, Bloody the lines between. If we not not now, you have musicians tapping from Fuji, from Juju, from all kinds of all kinds of other indigenous genres, and even R&B, foreign uh, rhythm and blues genre. So that's the kind of thing that the Lijadu sisters did, they, they, that they did. So I'm trying to explain that in a period in Nigeria where like there were there was like very little interaction between genres they were already doing the same thing that we call afro beats now so they had a couple of afro songs that kind of look like afro beats like that like sunshine balo alo balo were very close to afro beats even though it was without the horns but still they did not do afro beats even though they were like second cousins to fella so and the second question you asked the prevailing elements in their songs from my reading is the social critic. So they had like a lot of songs that were, that like were even folk songs, like Errora was a folk song, Bai and She was a folk song, is, is a folk song too. And all these songs are like very active in social critic. And they had an album that was danger and had like I wish I projected the cover picture of that album, the cover of the album. It was very it, it was very vivid, but still the way they their social critic was very subtle, it wasn't as direct as someone like Fela. So, 
that's like the running thing, like the running element in their song. Then they will be closest to Afrobeats because Afrobeats still remains like the most active, the most socially committed genre of music in Nigerian history, at least so far. So that, that so far that most people would agree that it's the most socially committed. So they did something that was close to Afrobeats, but they really did not conform to any kind of genre classification. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Is there a follow up or another question for any of us? We still have like 90 minutes, so we have time. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question for you. Um, what's your name? Rukayat. I re I really really enjoyed your um your presentation. Could you like talk a little bit about your positionality in relation to? you know, the genre that you talk about, do, do you, are you involved in any way or yeah, if you understand what I mean, yeah. You're muted. I think you should have mute. Mm -hmm. um, I informed, I intend at the beginning of uh, my presentation that it's just um, um, a, a new area that I'm trying to get to know. And um, I came about it when the call came out and I saw your, um, your abstract, and that is what mm. picked my interest. I have been doing some uh, little works on Carnival, but I wanted something away from Carnival and, you know, cultural, uh, gender, the women in Northern society, and um, how they are classified as oppressed, and particularly in an era where the separationist ideology was at its peak. I wanted to see how women break forth broke forth from the separationist ideology and penetrating the, and that's why I use pre slash uh, dominantly male you know, the predominantly uh, male sphere, which is termed to be public, because uh, even the public is said to be controlled by the men, because uh, the women, the, do the own is the domain of uh, the women. And that is why uh, the clerics would call um, Ualia to other when she used the Kalambu and say that you have to use the Kalabash because the Kalabash is, is a household, you know, um, uh, I, I don't, um, instrument, equipment, something that can people can easily relate to when they see you, they know you use the calabash in the kitchen, you use the calabash to fetch water, you use the calabash for a whole lot of things. And so, you know, those are nuances, those subtle nuances of, um, you know, hegemonic tendencies, hegemonic practices. And so I wanted to look at how this woman in that age was able to break forth from that dominance and influence other women who have gone on after a passing to become uh, voices that are being heard, that are being uh, forced to, the society has been forced to reckon with and the trainings, the influence that lives on. And that is what I have just started to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. If anyone has a follow-up, please like stop me anytime. I have a question for you, the other Ayo who talked about Fumi Adams, you know. Uh, you know, growing up, that music was like one of my favorite. But I have a question, like, you know, you I mean, you alluded to this, but I just need you to, you know, kind of talk more about it. So you chose Fumi Adams, you know, kind of, quote unquote, representing the West, and you, you chose Owenu representing the Southeast. And then, um, what is her name? Edna um, Ogoli. Edna Ogoli, um, representing like the you know, South, South, do you know the South, right? Like, did you say the South? South, South. Did you say the South? Okay. South, South. So, I, I mean, can you talk about, I mean, you mentioned why you chose them, you know, because of the kind of music that they wrote. Could you like expand on that? And again, did you find a woman in the North doing similar thing or did you not look or did you just decide to choose like these three women? Yeah. Hi, right, thank you so much. Uh, the choice of the music at this for, to represent uh, this story or to eat this story um, was based on the little research we've done on popular music mm. available within this region and uh, which we, we we are able to, to, to assess. 
In the last we've seen, uh, we've assessed the work of several popular artists, but uh, we have dominantly the the the, the male artists, people like uh, Balamila and the like. But uh, trying to see a female popular musician within this time, um, that whose works push or further the, 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 the promotion of peace in the society, we within the scope of our research, we've not we couldn't find or we've not been able to, to locate any. So there's we have um called uh, other artists um who have songs promoting or uh, other uh uh this say uh Virtues in the society, but our center was based on reflection of peace and unity. So these are uh, three of music uh, female artists. Their song were uh, prominent, and because they caught our thoughts, and within the time of the performance too, these songs were national songs. So it caught across regions and religion. When you look at uh, the for me, others do played in the uh, uh, in the in the in the eighties. Um, you you see that it's a reflection back to our independence, uh, independence cycle, and the principle and characters there being utilized, just like you see there in the uh, in the music video, are representatives of the whole nation. So aside the fact that uh, she lived in the north. Aside the fact that she lived in the north, and which I just like I affirm, she in that way she shared a dual representation or identity of the uh, west and the north. If you go back to at popular um, music within that time, you see that um, her, her presence in the north, her presence in the north was highly felt within that time because she moved beyond the popular language down to even the indigenous language. So that made, within this uh, context of our research, that made us to be at peace with it, that she has a dual identity. And so she will be able to stand as a representation to fulfill the gap in that Northern uh, space, which we should have a Toa or an, a, 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 yes, a, a musician of the soil. So we felt that she will be able to maintain the gap over the space of the northern region and that of the western region. I don't know if this uh, little explanation was able to shed light to your question, but you may explain too. Uh, it really to does. It. it really does. And you raise like you raise like important um questions about you know women's activities in terms of music in connection to music during this time in the northern Nigeria. Um I mean, some of them were singing, but everything you said is true. It wasn't necessarily like, I mean, it, it was also considered, you know, how is a popular song, but they weren't necessarily national songs. And there, there's also like, um, and, and you know, Nigerians, other parts of Nigeria, this is, they didn't necessarily get to, you know, experience them also because of, you know, um, gender restrictions. Um, um, and again, you raise another um, important question about, you know, the language, you know, um, being able to reach out to, you know, a larger audience. Sadly, you have to sing in some kind of English or broken, right, to be able to reach like a larger audience in Nigeria. I don't know if it's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing, but that is what Nigeria is, right? <laughs> I mean, if you, if you want to be able to communicate, that could just so be a reason why they you know we didn't know um a lot of them um but um i think your presentation is really um intriguing and it was a very good one thank you so much thank yeah so much. we still have 10 minutes any anybody want to ask questions in the I, floor there's a, there's, oh, a question the I, there's a question there but i have a question oh, when okay there's a follow-up uh, question it, um, oh follow-up question Okay, thank you very much for your interesting analysis. However, I was thinking you would include justice and equity within your scope of rethinking peace and unity. 
Or do you think there can be peace without justice or unity without equity? That's a really good question. Uh, thank you. I think that process to I believe. Um, thank you. So in the other work which we uh, analyze the aspect of justice and equity is there. If you look at towards the last bit one slide, just for the sake of time, we didn't dwell much on that. We said the yeah, work also talked about aspect of social justice. Because in the idea of why there's conflicts in the broader society, mostly is because of what? Injustice. And when you look at the Nigerian context, for instance, you see why people agitate and, you know, have a um, violent or peaceful movement. You see everything is tailored for the aspect of marginalization, social injustice, inequality, and the cry for peace. Yes. This aspect, even the Peace Scholar too, they agreed on it. And when you look at it, that's why Edna, for instance, in our song, when he was saying that stop this fight, stop this thing. Yes, you may go for watch for justice or push for justice, but going the violent way has not help, often helped us. So these are uh, scholars in their uh, these uh, musicians, they 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 join their mind back to the aspect of peace. In our struggle, uh, when you look at okay, let's when, when you look at okay, let's just take at our political uh, system and the you know most of the crisis we have in the nation is we know they are polar uh, polarized. It's either because regionally based, religiously based, or they're about they are, they have this attachment and everything is just towards justice. This region fighting for a more allocation, more uh, interest, more representation, and they about the youth also are, are, are agitating for their representation. That's why even in the election, my vote must count. It's justice, fight for justice. So is there in the analysis, only for the sake of time, we didn't dwell much on it for this. And so we cannot have peace with the social injustice. It is a good idea. And thank you for that observation. Thank you so much. That was really good. Ayo, did I see your hand is up? Do you want to contribute? Yes, I, I have a question. I have like a follow-up question for you. So I noticed that a lot of times this thing, this thing about suing for peace, the responsibility for peace, for this kind of palliative peace, calling for peace, especially singing about peace, is left to the women. I mean, not like men don't sing about nation building, but a lot of times you find out that it's women who always have to do this thing. And so Fumi Adams, I used when I was growing up, the popular, most popular Fumi Adams song that I remember is the one about song, about children, about parenting. And the, in the video, I have vivid memories of the video, like where she was like being this motherly figure. So men are allowed to sing about all kinds of things, just like their imaginations run well. While the women are left, or, already the, Nigeria does not have enough women music. So the few ones are, are, are called upon to sing this kind of propaganda song. Well, I'm not saying that these are necessarily propaganda, but a lot of songs about peace can also be propaganda, whether from the government or from like the record label. So and my question is just like, how do you like reconcile this fact? And so and my second question, which is connected to it, is for Dr. Okpara. So when in, in your analysis, have you considered this thing that I know is still debated anyway, where we, the people will talk about how the image of the mother is very, the image of the nation as a mother is very colonial. And so like some people would claim that oh, it's connected to Victorian values of the mother England and to, to the Elizabethan idea of, because that's when a lot of African countries became independent. So this is way that we look back to mother betray Britain. So a lot of people would say, oh yeah, the idea is very connected to it, even though some of our indigenous communities are like mother figures too. And also I think it's sometimes this idea of the nation as a mother is a cop out. So powerful nations get to be like Lady Liberty when they want to be. When they are fighting people, they become Uncle Sam. But the, the rest of us who were for, formerly colonized were just like this mother figure. And it's not an empowered mother, it's a very weak mother a lot of times. So that's my question for you. All right, thank um, you, you so much. Oh, yes, yeah, so that you can uh, continue with the session, maybe moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Ayodele BME. When your name was called first, I thought I was ushered into the panel to lead. I didn't know that uh, my co presenter here is Ayodele. I said, well, then we need to have a connection. So after now, we engage you. Thank you so much.
The aspect of peace, which you ask that, uh, what's the balance between the male gender and the uh, female gender? Yes, it's often promoted most by the female, but the fact that when we look at Nigeria uh, popular music spaces, you see that I think there's a there's a large representation or balance, so to say, where well, I will be able to call an equal balance, but I think there's a large representation towards a balance from the male um, music artists and the female. People like um, um, uh, Majek, people like uh, uh, Sonny Okoso, even go down to South Africa, people like Lucky Dube, they've sang song of peace. Majek and others, were, you, see, you understand, they've sang song of peace too for the land, even for um, during the South African apartheid region. The father means that me, uh, women, when it comes to war and crisis, they suffer most. Women and children, just like you observe, they suffer most. So the need for them to be not just pioneer, but to be at the forefront. Because you that they say he will wear the shoe, those uh, wear pitches, you, you understand. You that suffer, you know the importance and the relevance of it. And because of that, I think it's a good thing we need to celebrate them. But beyond that, the the, the, the campaign for peace is for all. It's for all, not only for musicians. It's for all, even teachers, even parents at home, even youth. The cyberspace is there for everyone. We have cyber uh, uh, crisis and uh, bullying. We have in, uh, cyber uh, you see, insecurity. You know, we can use this also. So it's for all. They have played their own part. We have to reflect towards it, see into it, and key into it, and challenge the campaign or the cause for peace in the land. Because just like I said, it is better to prevent war than to win, be a winner in the war. I don't know if I've answered your question or shed light on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I you are right when you say many times the conversation around motherhood is tied to colonialism. You know, it's because the concept of nation is Western, it's colonial. You know the way we were, we were right? <laughs> if you've done a little bit of pre-colonial history, we're just ethnic group, kingdoms, you know, living together. And I address some of these things. This is like a really large paper. You know, I just have to bring out a few words to talk to you about. Um, so it is hard to talk about the concept of nation and motherhood without tying it to colonialism, especially in the concept of, in the African concept, because this is what the nation, the nation is all about, you know, colonization, you know, bringing us together and having us, you know, perform in a certain way, right? But, you know, if you, if you, when I read my paper, I talked about how Walker advanced the theorizations of motherhood beyond patriarchy and you know now looking to how it functions specifically in 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 specific societies but then how specific it is and i'm also trying to analyze the nigerian situation which is a colonial project right and you know uh it's just hard you can't get away with that but if i apply that conception there's an article i'm writing and i'm applying it to like evil women it just takes like a totally different dimension because this is, you know, you'll be talking about one language, you'll be talking about people who believe in a certain thing, you'll be talking about people who believe in, you know, just have relatively like um, unity in terms of what they believe. But it's hard to do that when you talk about, you know, Nigeria as a nation because, you know, we are, you know, we are so many. So, I mean, should we not use the theory because it is colonial and it's like not being Nigeria because it's colonial, right? We still have to talk about that. I don't know if that makes sense. It's really complex, but this is where we are as Nigerians. Thank you so much with that. We'll end, it's 12.30. It's really nice to meet all of you. We have similar um, panels tomorrow by nine o'clock and then another one, I think at 12.45. So we have the same topic. We have like other scholars talking, I won't be talking again, I'll be sharing, but it should be other scholars, you know, talking about that. Please, we hope to see you. And thank you, everyone. This has been so wonderful. It's nice to meet you. I hope to meet you someday. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, bye. Bye. bye.